for those of you who don't know me yet, I am Lotus Thomas. I'm the program director for Coho US. And for those of you who don't know Coho US, we are the Co-Housing Association of the United States. And we're the national convener of the co-housing movement, providing education, advocacy, and networking for more and better co-housing. And our vision is to shift the culture toward a new American dream, where every home is surrounded by caring, collaborative neighbors who use less of the Earth's resources while living an abundant life. So hopefully you all resonate with that, and that's why you're here with us today. Um, we also are spearheading in 2023 a learning platform called the Co-Housing Institute. So this upcoming architect training is one of our first um, new programs that's in response to what we've been hearing from a lot of our stakeholders over the years as the convener of this movement. We've been bringing people together for these conferences and folks are just wanting more. They're wanting to go deeper. They're wanting more ongoing training. They're wanting more ongoing connections. And we did a virtual keynote for the kickoff of the Co-Housing Institute in December where we heard from Grace Kim as well as other leaders in the movement that one of the keys that we need to grow co-housing in the United States is we need to train more architects. I think Grace um, estimates we need at least 100 architects for us really to catch up with Europe and, and to get the U.S. co-housing movement um, on track to, to achieve this vision. So thank you all for being some of the early adopters of that. I'm just going to pass it over to Grace, um, just to let you all know some upcoming dates for this. If you don't join us for the whole thing is the training, this first cohort is going to be running from April 8th to June 11th and applications are due March 19th. So um, if you do decide that you'd like to be part of us, please do apply so that we can, um, we can see how many folks are going to be in this training. And today we're gonna to be hearing from renowned architect and co-housing leader Grace Kim, um, and she's going to share a bit more about the background and um, what this training is going to entail, and then at the end we'll have some time for Q&A from all of you. So feel free to write um, any questions or thoughts that come up throughout the presentation in the chat window, and both and or Kayla can help to uh, moderate the Q&A at the end. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Grace, for your leadership, and excited to hear from you today. Thank you. Um, okay, so I am going to start. Um, I, I brought a few slides with me um, to sort of introduce the topic and kind of why um, why this session is coming into being. Um, and then um, thought we could have some time for Q&A. I was going to just do Q&A and I realized that this early in the morning for some of you and just um, since everybody's new to each other, I didn't think it would be likely that people would jump right in with questions um, if we started off with an open, open format. So um, as Lotus said, please go ahead and fill, uh, type in questions as they come up, um, and it, either they'll get answered for you um, via Lotus and, and Kayla, or I'll take a look at those um, and use that to start the Q&A at the end. Okay. Oops, I should start with sharing my screen. Okay. There we go. All righty. Um, so, Really quickly, my, my husband and I, um, Mike Mariano and I, um, have been working uh, in the co-housing sphere for probably the last 15 or 20 years um, since starting our firm in 2004. Um, I've been in and around the co-housing movement um, in various different capacities as um, an architect, as a founder of my own community, um, and working with the co-housing association for um, a, a good part of, since 2006, I think. Um, and um, our firm is based in Seattle. We're a 15 person practice, pretty diverse uh, body of work. Co-housing is not the bulk of our practice. Um, it's really difficult. You can talk to Katie and Chuck. It's really difficult to, um, to run a practice around that, um, that housing model, but there is lots of interest and hopefully seeing all of you here um, heartens me to, to hope that there will be um, lots more architects working in this arena. Um, as I indicated, I do live in co-housing. Um, I'm the founder of a community with, along with my husband, and we um, live in a nine-unit community in Seattle, Washington. Uh, this is our neighborhood. You can see downtown Seattle in the distance. Uh, we're just a 20-minute 20, 20 walk downtown. Um, we live next to a really great park in a really urban neighborhood. Um, our structure looks like this. Um, we have an internal courtyard where you can some, see your neighbors coming and going. 
The courtyard is the source of activity for our group. Um, lots of things happen there. Um, and even though we're on a very small footprint, our lot is 4,500 square feet. So smaller than a single family lot in Seattle um, and in many parts of the country. Um, we packed a lot of program into it. So we've got nine households living on site and our office on the ground floor. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing a quick raise of hands or you can use your, um, your um, you can physically raise your hand or you can use the reaction button. Um, how many of you already have a good idea of what co-housing is? Seeing a couple of hands, George should raise his hand. Um, okay, so uh, thanks buddy. Um, so it, the vast majority of you don't know what co-housing is or have heard the term or somebody has said, you should go to come to the session and learn more. So I'm just gonna do a quick, I don't even remember if I have, oops, no, I didn't even include that. Okay, so what is co-housing? Co-housing is um, an intentional neighborhood where people know one another and look after one another. And as Lotus said, hopefully, you know, you're in a neighborhood surrounded by folks that care and know, know you and care about you. Um, the physical structure is anything. So it can be single family houses, it can be duplexes, it can be um, uh, an apartment building or a condo. Um, and the ownership is generally, generally it is owner occupied, but um, like I live in a building where it is, the residents own the building, but we're all renters of the building. So, uh, and then there's a few rental models and, and um, models that are uh, something in between, co-ops and things like that. Um, so the ownership structure isn't really important and the physical structure is not really important in terms of the, the structure. Um, we can talk about layout, uh, you know, separately. The layout is very important um, of the units and of the site. Um, but really what makes co-housing different from other types of housing is the intention that people come with. The intention to, to live together, collaborate. And when I say live together, they're not living in the same house. Everybody has their own home. Everybody's got their own private personal space, much like where you might live today. Um, the benefit is that they have um, just outside their doors, they have community space, common spaces that they share and, and work on together. Um, and they have neighbors out their door that are willing to, to lend a helping hand or to sort of um, participate in, in a fun activity or celebration at a, at a moment's notice. Um, you will notice maybe that I'm using just one hand. I have broken my collarbone. So if I grab my shoulder or I'm not moving my right arm, it's because of that. <laughs> so just note that. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, what is co-housing? So, and, and I will note that one of my reasons for starting um, this training program is um, inspiration from the founders of the co-housing movement. Um, in the US, in the US. Uh, Katie McCammon and, and Chuck Durrett are the founders of the co-housing movement. They introduced the US to this idea in the late 80s. Um, and it's an idea that they learned while they were studying in Denmark. Um, and so, and, and you know, they were sort of the, the go-to for co-housing for a very long time. Um, and Katie in the last, I think maybe eight or nine years has been working to increase the number of folks that are working on the development side of co-housing people that can help with the uh, marketing, with the development, sort of the evangelists um, of co-housing. And I was talking with a, another co-housing architect, Brian Bowen, and, and I are good friends. Um, Brian works in, in Boulder. And we were talking about um, how everyone's getting older, including ourselves, um, and that the handful of architects that have been currently working in co-housing um, up to this point, are aging and you know at some point we are not gonna have uh, the numbers that we have now. And the numbers are small. I will say there's probably a handful of architects that have done um, more than one, one co-housing project in the, in the nation in, in North America. Um, and then there's probably like a hundred plus that have done one and no more. One and done, that's what I call them. Um, so as Katie is trying to increase the number of folks that are participating in the co-housing movement through her program called the 500 Communities, um, Brian and I were talking and said, well, it's not enough to have, you know, all these developments, developers, marketer, marketeers, um, sort of burning souls who are wanting to initiate co-housing, who's going to actually help design them? Um, and 
the current model of there's only a handful that are going to do all of them, that's not a great model. Um, partly because I don't want to have a practice that's global. I'm very interested in having a local practice. We do get pull, pulled to different parts of the country to help consult on projects. Um, and that's what I do. I consult and I try to par partner them up with firms locally that are interested and able to do the work. But realistically, it'd be great to have architects locally all around the country that are interested in doing the work, able to help uh, forming communities get started and, um, and then have a network of folks to draw upon, um, as well as some, some coaching or some um, guidance from folks that have done it before. Um, because I, I've found that it's daunting for many people, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why and, and, and all that. Um, but if you have, like with anything, you know, if you were to design an airport or design a school or design a museum, then you've never done that before. Having somebody there to help guide you through that process makes it a lot easier to navigate. Because as architects, we can just solve all sorts of problems. We can figure stuff out. We know how to negotiate the permitting process and things like that and the design process. The thing that's different about co-housing is just the, the people process, the group process that we're not trained in, that we aren't familiar with, that many of us think it's a pain in the butt. Those are the things that are different about co-housing. So, so why co-housing? Um, I did a TED talk in 2017, and one of the things, and I've been working in the co-housing movement for since 2004 or before, um, but one of the things I realized in doing this talk is the incidence of loneliness in our country and how co-housing actually unknowingly, unwittingly is contributing to the opposite of that. So there were lot, there have been lots of articles written in, in popular press about co-housing. One of the folks that were at, was at the TED talk or the TED conference the same year as I did was, um, was a social scientist and she was talking about the same study that I was looking at. Um, and both of us were realizing that the longevity of life that, that researchers around the country, around the world actually, were looking at, um, but the data was, was sort of consolidated by a, a, an academic in Utah. But basically, what lots of folks were finding was that more than the typical things that people were um, paying attention to in terms of health outcomes for longevity of life, like, you know, not smoking, not drinking, exercising, being healthy, all those things, those are good, good and important. And one of the things that was even more important in, in determining how long you, one might live was the number of relationships they had, the close relationships they had, and how well integrated they were in their communities. So co-housing does that without any effort. Um, so, how is it different than other types of housing or other types of projects? Um, I would say this is the typical owner architect contractor relationship that you all are used to working with. Um, Co-housing is kind of like that, except that instead of one owner that's making one decision with one head, and I get that some of you might work in other areas where you might have a committee or a board or a multi-headed client group, um, the difference is that when you're talking about something very personal, like a home and where somebody's going to live for a very, very long time, um, those are not folks that are used to making big decisions with big amounts of money. They're, um, most folks in that category in co-housing have not ever designed their own home or done a home renovation. So anything in this realm feels like rocket science, something that feels very foreign and different and unusual from the normal things that they do. So you're dealing with a bunch of different owners. Um, and the architect not only serves in that role, our tr traditional roles, but we're also facilitators, mediators, translators, and counselors. Uh, when I talked with my friend who's an architect um, in the Bay Area about working in co-housing, and she does mostly single family projects, she was like, wow, that sounds like marriage counseling times 30. I'm like, yep, it's kind of like that. It's, it's a lot of group process work. In addition to this, you've also got sort of the unusual suspects in terms of consultants. You've got co-housing consultants, um, you've got process consultants, and there might be a host of other for folks that you are not used to working with um, in a typical project. This is on top of your normal engineers, landscape architects, whomever you have on your project teams. The road to co-housing is not a linear path. It's 
uh, very much of a, um, this looks like more of a shoots and ladder kind of situation, but there are times where you're constantly cycling through parts of the process as new people come and go, as um, new sites are found or lost. Um, and so there is a very um, nonlinear route in terms of project development. So there's a lot of um, folks sitting around the table, folks that have never been engaged with a development project or development process before trying to help, you're trying to help them navigate through this process, not just from a design standpoint, but sometimes from a, just a development standpoint. And some of you might be familiar a little bit with development because of your clients and the work that you've done, and some of you might not have any insight into that at all. So one of the biggest differences in uh, co-housing is compared to other project types is participatory design. Um, and some of you might engage this in other parts and in, in other projects that you work on. I will say it's in with co-housing, it's like what you might imagine with any other project times 10 or 100, because there are so many different other people involved. And, and we always try to insist on having one or a small group of folks that we interact with directly and one person that is our main point of contact. And yet still you'll get emails trickling in from people on the edges and the fringes wanting, to, you know, in, in one, the one time you would respond to something, then you get a flood of other emails. So there's this constant managing of, of folks. Um, but that process is really exciting because you get to work with people to design something that is very highly personal. And they'll make they'll be help, helping to make decisions about program, about site layout, about lots of things that you may or may not be accustomed to working with on your on your projects. And there's going to be a fair amount of input that you're going to have to receive, listen to, um, analyze, synthesize, and then be able to say back. Um, you're going to have to let them draw, um, and you're going to have to figure out ways to let them draw. When they have no skills to draw they don't think they have skills to draw but they have lots of opinions because if you don't allow them to participate in this way it comes back to you in not so great ways and you probably have, have experienced that on your other projects um, where board members or clients will send you sketches or excel floor plans or any you know any number of weird things that you might have experienced of, of clients trying to draw for you um, and then you're going to have to engage them through the construction process, bringing them along, you know, walking them through the site, explaining to them decisions during construction so that they can make decisions. And really, to be honest, I'll say that a lot of this, you could build a project for co-housing and not have them involved. And yet the important thing about working with communities is that as, you're, as you are building the community, helping physically build the structure, the process that you engage them in helps them build their uh, non-physical community. They, they, it helps them build bonds and form relationships and help them to work out the struggles and, and work through difficult problems together before they have to actually live together. And this is a really important part of the group dynamics that you are helping to nurture and foster through the design process. And in the end, it's so rewarding because when you get invited to come back for community meals or community celebrations, you do understand where they've come from, the journey that they've taken um, and the decisions they've made. And they will always be super excited to welcome you back in, share with you how things have evolved and really um, have you as part of their community. So why do, you, why do you need to take this course? Maybe I told you everything that you needed to know. Well, Hopefully, the thing, like I said earlier, the hopefully what I will be doing is helping, I'll be sharing it with you my pro tips. So I'm helping to guide you through um, things that are not part of the typical process. Um, helping you understand the process, um, a little bit of process planning, um, helping you think through agendas. Um, agenda planning for workshops is something that takes an inordinate amount of time. It can help you understand this, this will help you in formulating fee proposals. Um, that's another thing that, we, that I can help with. Um, we can talk about programming and how that, the, that whole part of, of the project that sometimes we don't get to participate. Sometimes we're handed a building program by the owner. They say, we wanna build a school and here's the number of classrooms and here's the, you know, the administrative spaces and the other spaces. And this is how it needs to function. This is the budget. 
you know, a, a whole host of things. In co-housing projects, I can tell you what I think will be in the program, but again, it's really important the process of the community talking about those things and having mutual agreements before they move in will help them make good decisions throughout the design process and will help to reduce conflict once they move in. Um, I can share with you different concepts about site planning and layout um, and about common house design. This is an area that I have a little bit of expertise in. Um, there's very lit little written about the design of uh, communal, sp communal spaces, community spaces in co-housing and or in any other project type. Um, this is something I've spent quite a bit of time in. Um, and I can also share with you some concepts about acoustics, not rocket science, but things that are really important to the function of the common house and um, and could be applicable in other projects we work on. So that is my quick spiel about what co-housing is, kind of why you might be interested um, in th this project type um, and what you might get out of this course. Um, the course itself, um, if you follow this link and hopefully uh, Lotus or Kayla can drop this into the chat window, um, this link will take you to the res registration site and that has more information, um, but basically the dates are set out like this. Um, the hope is to accomplish this in, um, in six sessions. Um, these are the general headings and topics um, that we'll be talking with, talking about. Um, a lot of the content will be provided by me, but there will be some guests that will be coming in now and again. Um, and really the intention is to have some sort of lecture, me talking at you or somebody talking at you, but a lot of discussion amongst the group. The idea is to form a cohort group so that once the program is over, that you have not only me as a resource to call upon, but also others that you've worked with, that you've built a rapport with, that you can also call upon to collaborate, to share ideas, um, to ask opinions of, because really trying to grow a movement isn't about one person holding the power and trying to dictate what happens. It's really about everybody um, working collaboratively. In, in, I would say in the co-housing movement, um, there's so few of us um, and there's very little written about it. It's really helpful for us to learn from each other. And that's been a really beneficial thing. Brian and I are really good friends um, and we've been working in this space together for maybe almost 20 years. Um, and we've learned a lot from each other and it's really helpful. And we've learned lots from folks that have come before us who have shared things with us, Katie and, the, and Laura Fitch and, and Chuck and others. Okay, I think that's the end of my slides. So I'll stop sharing um, and I can stop sharing. Grace, can you talk a little bit about the time of day that you're gonna be offering these? Cause some folks are asking about that. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I recognize Clara that you're in a different time zone. There's a couple of you. Um, the time frame is gonna be about five hours. Um, and I think once we have the group Together, um, we can determine the actual time chunk. Um, but the, originally, the my thinking was that it would be something between like ten and whatever, ten and three or something like that, um, Pacific time. Being selfish as the person organizing the the, the group, I was going to try to do it during that time. But I think depending on where folks are coming from, we might be able to adjust if if need be. But that will be kind of decided amongst the group. Yeah, and, and, uh, if and if there's no consensus, then that might be the default chunk of time, to the 10 to 3. Okay, great. And it's alter, it's on different um, days, some Saturdays, some Sundays. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, that was really trying to accommodate different people's needs. Um, one of the reasons that it, so I will say that this, this uh, program started with me and Brian trying to do this together, um, and we were trying to work it out so that we were um, not airing, interfering with ski season and not interfering with um, with the summer vacations and things like that. And we also, I also recognize that people have other commitments on the weekend. So hopefully the idea of, of rotating between Saturdays and Sundays is that if anyone had a, a, a very um, regular you know, event that happened on a day that perhaps trying to get out of two or three days instead of six days would be less burdensome. So that was kind of the point. Um, and here's a question more about the content. Will there be anything about dealing with zoning for co-housing projects? I probably won't be addressing zoning specifically. Um, there will be some um, 
one on one time um, that we can talk about projects specifically. Um, and, and so sharing kind of like tips or tricks of how it's worked elsewhere. Um, but I would say that in general, codes are so local, especially zoning, um, that it's difficult. But I can certainly share strategies of, you know, types of zoning to look for if you don't have a site or strategies for um, how to approach a, a rezone or, um, you know, the entitlement process and things like that. Um, but I, I, I don't know, Jenna, do you want to say a little bit more about your question? You'll have to come off mute if. Okay, Sorry, I, I'm not I'm not used to this, but um, so I was just hitting all the buttons. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I feel like zoning is one of the biggest challenges to finding any kind of alternative housing models or or proposing or, you know, there's lots of hurdles, but that's kind of the first one I usually hit. Yeah, my advice to any group starting up is don't try to change zoning. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a piece of property where the zoning is in place to do what you want to do. Um, that's because it's going to be a long process as it is. Right. Just yeah. the, the group process. Adding another six to twelve months for a rezone is not not helpful to anybody. Kind of a deal killer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, unless there's a really strong reason, like if there is a group that wants to farm a lot of their land and they and somebody has the property, great. But but aside from something like that, like I. A group that's trying to make it out in the, the wilderness alone. Um, good luck. I will speak to this that we do have um, later this spring, the Institute will be hosting some meetings um, that will be focused on advocacy at both the local zoning level as well as federal policy, because in Europe, there's been federal policies that have really streamlined getting co housing developments in place, but that's definitely a different aspect of the institute but do stay tuned and join our mailing list if you want to be involved with that part of the conversation as well um and yeah i'd love to speak to this question uh, by ozzy will we offer any form of certification or a directory of people who've completed the course and that is more of a coho us institute um aspect that we're exploring right now but one of the things that the coho us um one of the ways that we're kind of unique in what we're doing in the co-housing movement is we actually are really strongly supporting the professionals. And we do, we get 70,000 visits to our website every month of a lot of people who are wanting to hire professionals. So really expanding upon our professional directory is one of the goals for 2023. And absolutely people who complete this training will have a sort of bad it's definitely something. Oh, sorry, yeah, my uh, internet connection is a little unstable. Um, Wendy, I see your hand up. So if you have the opportunity to write in the chat, that's mm -hmm. great. I can have you speak in a second. I just wanted to answer Ozzy. I don't know where you lost me, but um, yes, we're going to have a way of um, acknowledging folks who graduate from this program. And we're growing our professional directory. And we have a professional partnership program for the first time this year. So the, um, Kayla is going to put that link in at some point soon if you want to learn more about that. And um, someone else had asked, Grace, and I wanted to see if you could speak to the possibility of asynchronous participation in the program, since one of the things the Institute will be offering is all the recordings, as well as a forum for people to engage in the discussion in between sessions. So I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah, we can. Um, I think the asynchronous might work as a sort of, um, if people want to buy modules and just listen to the lecture, I think one of the benefits of being in the course together is that between like if you just count up the number of hours of the lectures or whatever, it's not going to come up to 30 hours or whatever, or you know, the five hours mm -hmm. worth of content in time. It's really the discussion time during that you will miss out on um, and the resource sharing in that way. So um, I would say for the cohort for this first course, um, it's it's going to be synchronous. Um, and there will be opportunities after the course, after the first round of the course, for folks to just um, buy a la carte different sections, um, but I don't know what that looks like quite yet. 
Yeah, and I think what I wanted to add is just that if people aren't able to make one session, we, we can have the recordings in the Institute that people can be engaging with there. Um, there is also a question from so, Kate. So, so yes, and like for the folks that are gonna be participating in this first cohort, the dates are, are posted there and it's really important to look at them to make sure that you're gonna be able to attend. Um, I would say my preference would be that you can attend all of them. Um, it's possible um, if you are gonna miss one that we can probably work around that. And, and to Lotus's point, we can probably get a recording out to you so you can watch it and be ready for the next session. Um, but if you're gonna be missing more than one, then I would really have you reconsider whether this is the time to do, do this course. Um, it will be most helpful for everybody if everyone can be there um, learning at the same time, because it, like I said, it's that cohort that we're trying to really um, create and sort of encourage. And there was a question about when you'll offer this next, which I don't think we have an official answer for because it's somewhat um, based on how this first one goes. But I do think that you had mentioned we're going to probably raise the price for the future training. So joining now is an opportunity to get the, the first cohort pricing. If you want to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, basically, this is a trial balloon, right? We're trying to figure out like how to, how this is going to work and 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 um, it's, it's sort of the beta version. So that's why it's at a, a reduced rate. Um, my hope is that, that we would do this course at least once a year. Um, and if there's enough interest, maybe twice a year. Um, but the hope is to increase the participation because if we're trying to get to 100 architects so that we can build 500 communities, um, that's not gonna be you know, enough to do training for five or 10 people every year. Like that, I guess in 10 years, we could get to 100 if we, if we did 10 people each each year, but I'm impatient. <laughs> I would love to, I said a hundred and then that was just a number. I mean, I think that if we could have um, hundreds of architects working in this sector, um, that would be a benefit to the world. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Carrie wanted to know um, what the demand is for co-housing architects. And I wanted to just speak to, I think I got cut off when I was saying <clears throat> that our website gets 70,000 visitors a month of people who are largely looking at developing co-housing communities and looking for professionals, which is a big part of why we're wanting to do this training and why we see this demand. I don't know if you have any other um, examples, Grace, of how much demand there currently is. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what the exact demand is, but there are, there are weeks that, or there are days where I'll open my email and there'll be four or five um, inquiries about things. And it's like, what just happened that there's four emails in my inbox? This was like a, a couple weeks ago. Um, I would say that it's pretty regular that we get inquiries. Um, and I'm just trying to think right now, there's like two or three that we're meeting with this week that just contacted us this week. Um, so like I said before, it's not that you can build a practice around it because there's a lot of people that are looky-loos trying to figure out, trying to kick the tires and figure out if co-housing is for them. Um, and some folks will just take quite a while to actually get there. Um, but I do think that there are, I have talked to lots of folks in other parts of the country that I consult with. Um, and sometimes they come to me after having worked with somebody local and it not working out. Um, there's lots of folks that are trying to do things locally because it makes sense. You know, the local architects know the codes, they know the contractors, they know the, the construction te techniques that are appropriate for their climate. Um, and like I said, there's, it's a, the process is not typical. And so um, there's a lot of wheel spinning and churning and frustration that happens um, and, and we're trying to avoid that. So I, I couldn't tell you how much demand there is out there. There is, I think there's probably, Lotus, you probably know the numbers of the forming communities. I wanna say it's like over a hundred. Yeah, there's 170 forming communities that we know of right now. Um, and that's usually they've gotten pretty deep into the process. So, you know, there's no telling how many more. And, you know, this goes to what I was speaking to around the advocacy work that we're doing and just how Coho US is positioning itself right now where we're really, building the market and it goes hand in hand. We don't want to build too much demand without actually having the professionals ready to be able to support them. So it goes hand in hand with doing this training. And it's why we're really looking at finding early adopters that want to be part of this, that really can get in at the early stages of us really growing the market on the next level. Um, we do have some other questions here. Um, just to answer, answer Wendy briefly, she said it would be useful to be able to replay the recordings um, absolutely, that's part of what the 
the Institute's offering. Um, I saw Mackie ask for the- my previous question. Oh yeah. Go ahead, Wendy. Oh, just what is the when does it start as far as like time and and I, I saw that it was four hours, but like which four hours? So that's what I was saying. Once the cohort is identified in terms of who is going to be in the group, then we'll um, discuss the the actual time. My default is ten to three. So that's that would be when that when I would. In, in Grace's perfect world, that's when we would start. But if we get folks from Europe or if we have folks from the East Coast, we can we can discuss amongst the group to see if we want might want to adjust it a couple hours um, one way or another. So that's Pacific time, 10 Pacific. to three. So that would be what, two o'clock my time, two to six. I don't know where you are. East Coast. So yeah, so that'd actually like, that would work better um, for me. One to, one to five. One to six. Um, Mackie asked the question if there is um, if this is appropriate for non-architects. I would say probably not. Um, we'll be talking about architecty things, and so um, I would I would say if you're not an architect actively looking to work with with communities in the architect role. This is probably not the class for you. Um, if you're wanting to get involved with co-housing development as a non-architect, I would really encourage you to look at Katie's 500 Communities Program. That's probably more geared towards what you might be looking for. This is really focused on, I'm basically trying to train my competition. I'm looking out 10, 15, 20 years, and I would love to see a hundred folks there when I'm ready to retire, if I retire. Um, Robert asked, asked um, he's retired, but has years of experience, but no prospects locally. How might he participate? So again, Robert, if you're interested in practicing, like even though you're retired, if you're interested in working with with communities and being um, the architect to get them started, or you know just to, to do the initial, you could do initial programming phases and work with a local architect. Um, that would be totally appropriate for you because you will understand the, the jargon, you'll understand kind of the process. Um, but but if you're thinking that you're, you're just interested and you might wanna participate in forming a community or getting folks interested or doing some advocacy, I'm not sure if this will be the right course for you. And I'm saying that because it's a big investment of time and a big investment of money. And I want I wanna make sure that you're using your your time and money in an, in an efficient and appropriate way. Deborah asked, is it appropriate for architects to learn more but don't have a prospective client? Certainly, I would say, if, even if you don't have a client, I would say most, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm making assumptions. Um, I would love to see a raise of hands or you could drop in your, your the chat window if you have an active client, but I'm hoping that this is for folks that are either looking to expand their business or get into a new line of business. Um, Architects that architects tend to be ones that help initiate or help um, a, a community, a, a forming community, move forward. Just because we have problem solving skills, that's what we were taught in architecture school: is how to solve problems. Um, so we generally have good intuition about how to move people forward. And so um, I would love for architects anywhere in the in the world, I should say country, but anywhere in the world, to have a group come to them and say, "I have this idea." How do, I, how do I get started? And it might mean that you say, go find a developer or go find land, but you need to know the steps of the process so that you can do those things. Um, because I think there's too many folks that are being contacted now by folks that say, I wanna build co-housing and the architects are saying, what, what's co-housing? And they, you know, they, they just translate that in their mind to, oh, it's this type of housing that we're accustomed to doing. Um, and, then, and then running into some, some difficulties. So, um, I'm hoping to get folks trained and ready to go so that when they have these prospects or to be able to put out there a call to say, hey, you know, we're doing an info session on co-housing, come and learn more about it. Um, and that might inspire folks to take this first step or to find each other so that they can make the first step forward. So yes, Deborah, come. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Yeah, I'll just echo that. I, I had our um, advocacy interns helping us to get the word out about this because actually having professionals driving this process is a really key aspect of the advocacy and it gives credibility to the movement and vice versa. And I saw from a lot of people that were interested that are joining this um, info session right now, you all are interested in what you can do, what kind of design is going to be the most ecologically and socially sustainable approach, which is really important on a larger advocacy level. So that's really why our vision isn't just about a specific co-housing development, but actually achieving a certain quality of life through co-housing inspired design. So whether you're directly doing a co-housing community for a co-housing client, or you're borrowing from some of the co-housing skill set and design approach to be able to integrate that into a multifamily development or other kinds of plan unit developments that may have not an exclusive co-housing bent, but that you could actually borrow from some of this design and also be working with peers that are also focused on social and ecological sustainability, that you're really kind of creating a little subculture um, for your design approach that will set you apart, whether you're doing co-housing exclusively or just something that could be influenced by it and kind of be a competitive advantage for folks that care about social and ecological design aspects. Yeah, and to that point, like we, I, I jokingly say to our clients and our staff, we will sneak in co-housing principles to lots of our multifamily projects, even when they're not co-housing. So we work in a lot of affordable housing. Um, we work in some market rate housing, mostly community oriented um, or yeah, community oriented or community initiated projects that might not be co-housing. Um, but even in our, you know, recreation work or, or uh, um, other project types, transit work, um, in our process, uh, we use a lot of the co-design or participatory design processes that we would typically do in co-housing. I use a lot of those in our other projects. Um, Wendy, do you still have your hand up? Is that, um, you, do you just need to lower your hand in the, in the icon or do you have another question? Okay. Um, Ozzy asked, as a practice model, do you typically have at least one co-housing project in process? Hmm. I guess um, there one at least one in some phase, um, and that might just be consulting. Um, right now, we are working on. We're just trying to. We're, we've been trying to wrap up for a while um, construction on a project in Anacortes um, that is mostly a senior group. Um, we are in permitting stage right now for a co-housing development in Marysville. These are places in Washington. Sorry, um, that uh, is in, in the permitting process right now. Um, both of them are very different in form. One is a, a small cottages, 1,200 square foot units, um, homes uh, spread on a, a four acre parcel. And then the other one is a combination of townhouses and stacked flats. And then we're consulting with a group um, in Pennsylvania and I've done various like, our practice, our, our co-housing work tends to be a, a sort of a wide gamut of things. It's like straight up architecture, you know, uh, site planning to construction, um, as well as uh, review of common house plans for different groups or uh, review of site plans or just consulting um, in a broad sense. So it's it's a variety of things and those are the kinds of things that we can talk about um, in the cohort, um, what some of those practice models might look like. Great, um, and I would love for other folks to ask more questions. If you have any, I do wanna um, share a couple things that are coming up with Coho US. I'm just gonna share screen here. <clears throat> My internet connection will let me. Um, so like we talked about, there's the um, application deadline for the training on March 19th. Um, someone said the tiny URL may not be working. So Kayla can put that, um, link in there again. <clears throat> we also, I had mentioned before that we have a professional partner program and professional partners actually save 25% on this training. So it actually covers the cost of the partner program um, with your savings. And we're gonna have an orientation that I'll be leading next Wednesday. Um, that is going to be an opportunity for you to learn about the benefits of partnership with Coho US um, and ask questions and offer suggestions. So that's the kind of moment where you'll be able to um, actually offer input and how we could really support you as a professional who wants to be getting into this space more. 
Um, so you can join us. And again, hopefully Kayla can put the link in the chat for that, or there's this tiny URL and that's free um, and it will be recorded. So if you register for it, you'll be able to get the recording if you're not able to join us live. And then every month on the 10th at 10 a.m. Mountain, we have another free event that is called the Commons. And it's a monthly gathering for people from the co-housing movement, anywhere from the very beginning curious person all the way to people like Grace and other experts in the movement. So one of the things I heard Grace mention was sort of the, the community or the network or the relationships between co-housing professionals, because it is a very sort of subculture, small niche. Um, of people, and even when she was talking about the clients, that it's very relationship oriented. So this is an opportunity once a month to really feel um, what that community is like and to get to know some people. And it can be an opportunity to meet new clients or put yourself out there or learn more about what projects are happening. Um, so if you are able to, I think Kayla has the link for that that she can put in the chat as well. We'd love to have you join us either tomorrow at 10 um, Mountain or one of the other commons that's always on the 10th. And then this is just to mark your calendars. Um, we are going to be having an open house weekend, which is something we do annually. That is an opportunity for you to actually virtually or in person visit some of the um, many of the co-housing communities in the U.S. So if you haven't actually visited any before, um, this is a great opportunity to, to get to see them in action. And I think it would be great for anyone in the co-housing architect training to participate this, in this in some way, Grace. So that's what we have coming up, um, as well as many other trainings that are oriented more to folks who are looking at developing co-housing. So um, cohousing.org and cohousinginstitute.org are great places for you to go and check out our upcoming offerings. And we do have um, an early registration discount for the other Institute trainings that ends tomorrow. So if people wanna look and, and get in on that, the discount is March 10 for March 10th. Um, and I know that's a lot of information, but if you have any questions, I'll put my email and you're welcome to just email me directly. Um, and yeah, just so, so excited to have so many of you on the call with us today and that we're going to be hosting this upcoming training for the beta launch and just so grateful for you grace and your leadership and, and i'll just make a, another plug for the um the the partnership the uh, the partner program that lotus mentioned at the beginning so not only does it give you a discount to this course but it gives you access to lots of um previously recorded conference sessions and talks so that if you are new to this, um, this concept and wanna learn more, um, or you wanna learn about the, the groups, the process side of things, the group side of things, um, there's lots of uh, recordings from previous conferences. Um, Coho US did a great job when the pandemic hit, they pivoted instantly to doing online um, conferences and did a number of sort of mini conferences, a couple, I think three of them throughout the year for the, for the first two years of the pandemic. So, um, there's really good content on, on there um, that you can have access to. So I would highly encourage it. It's a it's a good deal. Like she, like she said, it will cover the cost of your um, partnership membership. Yeah, yeah. There's over 200 on-demand recordings that partners have access to. And if you have a firm, the part the professional partnership actually gives access to all of your um, staff. So it's an amazing deal to be able to get all that on-demand training. Um, and I'm the partnership coordinator. So if you're interested, besides joining us on the Zoom next week, you can also just email me and I'm happy to have a call with you and, and just share more and see how it's a good fit. We also do have a sponsorship program. Um, Schemata Workshop is one of our sponsors or supporters um, that actually gets a lot of visibility. We advertise directly for them on the website, which again, with 70,000 visitors a month, it's it's really great exposure. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the ways that we're convening this movement is really helping to connect the potential clients with the professionals and then the professionals with each other. Because it does seem like part of the culture of co-housing is more of this cooperation, cooperative lifestyle, and that you see that also in the professionals that are really cooperating and working together. It's rare that there's just one professional working on a project that usually it seems like um, Grace was saying people are consulting with one another. And so I really see um, both this training and what Coho US are doing as a way of really fostering those professional alliances in ways that can create more business for everyone.
Any um, other final questions? Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today.